Give God a hand clap of praise. I know, I know it's working for us. Is it working for you where you are? Yeah, I don't have to worry about it because he's working for me. And I love it because he's intentional. He means it for me. 
Yeah, never failing. Come on now, we're having a great time already this morning, and I hope I hope you've gotten ready to uh, hear a word from the Lord. I don't know how you can not be ready after our dynamic praise service. I want to thank our musicians for putting it in this morning, getting us ready to go. And I also want to thank Anthony for those dynamic words. Some of you may have had trouble seeing or hearing what he said, but let me see if I can summarize it very briefly before I get into the Word of God. You need to know that there is no doubt that God has been intentionally blessing us throughout this phase uh, of our country, throughout this phase in our state and in our city. There's been no accident about how God has been blessing us. In fact, he's used this opportunity to expand the reach into more homes that would have been reached on a regular Sunday morning. And can I tell you this? The government doesn't have to come and pronounce that it's okay to come to church. We don't need for Donald Trump to be an expert on when it's time to go to church. We know how to worship the Lord. He's not the one we're going to be following on that. Use your heart. Follow what the Lord tells you. Turn on some device, a phone or TV or something, and tune in to somebody who's talking about Jesus Christ. And I can tell you, every single Sunday since all of this started in our country, we haven't missed a beat here at 45th Street Baptist Church. We've been able to put it out to you. We've been able to celebrate with you. We've been able to show you and tell you exactly what's going on. I want to make sure you understand that we have not forsaken anybody. We are doing every single thing we can in order to make sure you continue to get the Word of God as profoundly as you can each time. God bless you. God bless you. We are wonderfully blessed here in this space. And today we're going to bring you a word from the Lord, word from the Lord. Each Sunday we tend to get, we think, a little bit better. That doesn't mean we don't have some hiccups, but we're just doing the part we can to get it better. If we were doing any better, they'd probably have to put letters like NBC or CBS outside the door. We were producing it any better, but we're getting there. We're getting there. We're not NBC and we ain't got that kind of money. We're not CBS or all those places. But as soon as we can uh, get that kind of revenue, we'll put it out like that too. God bless you this morning. I hope your family's doing well. Our church members are making progress. Continue praying for our deacons who are, who are struggling with recovery. Some in hospitals. Some are, some are uh, home and recuperating. Pray for Walter. Walter's still recu recuperating. That's Walter Wright, our cooker, our cooker, our chef. He's uh, recovering from his... Uh, his surgery, but doing well, in good spirits, in good spirits. Uh, lost a little weight, but his spirit is high. Deacon Miles is still in the hospital. Pray for him. Pray for Sister Betty Rogers. Her sister passed away. She's struggling this morning. Pray for Sister Mary Cole, who's had some issues. We, we, you know, that's the beauty of a church congregation. Can I say this before I preach? The beauty of a church congregation is that we know about each other. We care for one another. We reach out to one another when things are going well. And the pastor ought to be able to call the name of the folk who are in his flock and know what's going on and be able to reach out and touch them. That's the beauty of fellowship. And can I tell you, what we're missing is the unity that comes from seeing and being around one another. That's the struggle we're having. But we still have ways to reach out and touch. Pick up the phone, call somebody. If it's your family and you can, go see about them. But don't forsake talking to one another. That's what we're missing. And one day, soon and very soon, we're going to meet up in the sanctuary again and be able to celebrate in person. Today, we're going to continue in our sermon series, a sermon series that we've been working on called Women of the Bible. I've been trying to get off the beaten path and talk about some women in the Bible who maybe we don't talk about often. Uh, I know there's a, a, a list of them that we, we always call the names of, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with studying them. But I also think that there's some lessons that we can learn from those whose names aren't on the beaten path. In fact, they wouldn't be in Scripture. They wouldn't be in the Bible if God didn't intend for us to learn something from them. And today I want you to go to um, the Acts of the Apostles, the Acts of the Apostles, and let's see what kind of lesson we can learn from the Acts of the Apostles. I believe it's appropriate for us to turn to chapter 9. Chapter 9. There is a woman there who has just been a blessing. And I believe she'll be a blessing to you as well when you learn more about her. 
the Acts of the Apostles, if you didn't know, were written by Luke. Luke. And he recorded the, the infancy of the church and what happened after Jesus Christ was resurrected and ascended back into heaven. And the disciples had to go on from there. That's why we're recording the activities of the uh, apostles. And so around the 36th verse of chapter 9, you'll find these words. You'll allow me to read them in your hearing. Acts chapter 9, verse 36. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. Underline disciple. In her Greek name, is Dorcas. All right? In Greek, her name is Dorcas. And she was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died. And her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa. So when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room, underlined upstairs. All the windows stood around him. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. And Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. And he took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa. And many people believed in the Lord. Now, I know the natural inclination after reading the scripture like that is to key in on verse 40, where Peter apparently resurrected a woman who was dead. And while that is, that is key in this Bible study, I got to tell you, there's some things, in my opinion, that are much more important for us to understand today. I'm not ignoring the wonderful miracle that was created when God allowed that to happen. But let's look a little bit deeper and maybe before that action happened in this story. Well, let me ask you this. Are you familiar with the medical wonder called penicillin? Have you ever heard of penicillin? There's hardly anyone that hasn't heard of the life-saving modern medicine antibiotic called penicillin. Maybe you've even heard of the name of Sir, Ar Sir Alexander Fleming. He's the pharmacist who discovered the medicine. Or maybe you've even heard of Mr. Fleming because the same name, Jonas Salt, will ring a bell because he too had a hand in creating the life-saving drug of penicillin. Dr. Salk was a 20th century medical researcher, and he was most famously known for his development of the first successful polio vaccine. So you've heard of maybe Sir Alexander Fleming. Many of us have heard of Jonas Salk. But how many of you have heard of the name Henrietta Lacks? Henrietta Lacks. Mrs. Lacks was an African-American mother of five who moved from the tobacco farms of Virginia to one of Baltimore's poorest neighborhoods in the mid-1900s. And in 1951, at the age of 31, Mrs. Lacks, unfortunately, was diagnosed with cervical cancer. Well, in the process of her diagnosis, a biopsy was taken from Ms. Lacks, and the cells were removed from her cervix. Those cells that were removed from Ms. Lacks have created an immortal, underline that word, immortal, 
continuously living cell line that in scientific circles is known as HeLa. HeLa. The cell line has remained since it was removed from Miss Lax. In 1951, it has remained under continuous observation and it's made possible some of the most important discoveries in modern medicine. This is a cell line that was removed from a cancer-stricken African-American woman named Henrietta Lacks. This story went untold, unreported, until a book was written. Recently, in, 19, in 2017, Oprah Winfrey produced a movie on this story called The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks on HBO. It's stories like this of people who have given more than one could ever imagine to, to the progress of other people. Ms. Lacks, in her sickness, provided more help for other people so they could live than she could ever possibly have imagined. In fact, her family had to sue in order to make sure that the rights to the HeLa cells were compensated, uh, her family was compensated for it because so many other people have made trillions of dollars from this woman. She didn't give it to make money. She didn't even know money could be made from it. But I came to tell you, she has blessed so many people. She's an unsung hero of modern medicine and but for some courageous writers and investigators, no one would have ever known who she was. Can I tell you this? We have unsung heroes in our churches every day. We have unsung heroes in our communities every day. And the story I just read to you in the Acts of the Apostles, talking about this woman named Tabitha. She goes by Tabitha. That's her, her Aramaic name. Tabitha, in Greek, her name is Dorcas. Dorcas, both of them mean the same thing. They mean gazelle, gazelle. And it must have been some indication of her frame and, 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 and how graceful she was when, her, when she was born or her, her parents thought she was graceful. But Tabitha or Dorcas, whichever one, either is right, has blessed us in so many ways. Can I tell you this? We start out with this. Some heroes wear capes, others make them. Some heroes wear capes, but other heroes make them. There's a woman in this scripture who's much like Henrietta. She lived over 2,000 years ago, and we've heard through the scripture about how loved she was. And she, uh, I told you to underline as we were reading there in the first part of the scripture, underline the word disciple. That's important. Let me tell you why it's important. The very first and the only time the word disciple was used in reference to a woman is with Dorcas. In the scripture, in the Bible, the only time the feminine tense of the word that's used for disciple is in referring to this woman. Can I tell y'all, she was a believer. Not only was she a believer, she used her faith and what she understood of Christ to help other folk. There's probably no doubt that she sat under Christ's teachings while he was alive, since this occurs shortly after Christ was crucified. This woman heard him, and because of what she heard from Jesus Christ, and no doubt the reinforcement from his disciples, she believed and she acted on it. She was a pupil, an apprentice. That's what a disciple is. She heard the master's call, and she heeded the master's call. She lived in a town called Joppa. Today it's called Jaffa. Jaffa. It's the same city where Jonah, the prophet, boarded the boat to get out of town so he could go to Tarshish, which means he was trying to get away from God. Jonah used that place to get away from God, and Tabitha used it to get closer to him. Doesn't matter where you are, it matters who you are and what you're trying to do, all right? We know this, we know this, we know that there was a church in that town. How do we know that? Because the scripture said, the scripture was very clear um, when it says that 
um, the disciples heard. Well, the only reason you have disciples there is because there's a church there. And so the disciples heard of what was going on. There was a, there was a, a miracle there that took place, which is the only reason why we're talking about this in Scripture. Otherwise, we'd never know about Dorcas. Dorcas was the woman in town who helped everybody. She could. She wasn't the one who flashed it around. She wasn't the one who told everybody about it. She was just a helper. How many of y'all know somebody like this? That whatever they got, you got it. Whenever they can help you, they'll help you. But they don't live extravagantly, although they're comfortable. And whatever it is the Lord has laid in their hand, they use those hands to make it better and provide you with something that was Dorcas. Can I help you with this? Dorcas was a seamstress. A seamstress, like I told you. Some heroes wear capes, but somebody's got to wear, somebody's got to make the cape that the hero wears. Uh, how many of you have ever seen the story, and I bet I asked young, some of the young folk, they know the story, The Incredibles. The Incredibles, while the family that's referred to as the Incredibles are the ones doing all the heroic stuff, there's also a little, a small woman who creates every costume they wear, who creates every device they wear. She is the Dorcas of the Incredibles. Nobody pays any attention to her, but without her making the fire retardant costumes, the costumes that make you invisible, the costumes that stretch and make you fly, without her making those costumes, none of them would be able to do what they do. And the same thing is true of these women. Dorcas helped these women at a time when nobody else would. The Bible says that she was friends of widows. We, 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 we misunderstand widows in this context today. We don't understand today like they did then. I'm not saying that widows don't suffer today, but there's a margin of relief available for people who don't have a husband or someone to look out for them today. Not so much at that time. If you were a widow or a, a, a woman who had had a child out of wedlock at that time, you were an outcast. You had nowhere to live. Men wouldn't do business with you for fear that it would endanger their reputation, and it was a struggle for them. You would hope that you had a son who could come in and intercede for you, or perhaps a nephew or a brother who would look out for you. Those women struggled, and most of them were poor and had to turn to uh, measures that they otherwise would not have turned to, like prostitution, in order to care for themselves. And can I tell you today, it was a constant, constant struggle just to even put food on the table. Dorcas was the one who ministered to that group in the community that we're talking about. Some heroes wear capes. Others make them. Can I tell you this? Christ-led good works and charity don't need a press secretary, all right? You don't need a PR firm to tell everything you're doing when you're working for the Lord. You don't need somebody to put your, your image out there when you're working for the Lord because your image is a reflection of his image, and Christ don't need no PR he already has done all the work that needs to be done. His work tells it all, and as long as you're mirroring what he's doing, then now that's all the PR you need to do, and that's what she did. She helped people who could not help themselves. She made clothes for them. Can I tell you, even when you're poor, the issues of life still come. You still got to get up and go to work every day. Somewhere, you got to have something to wear when you go there. If you're going to work in somebody's house, even as a maid, you still have to have an outfit to put on when you go in there. If you're going to go and, 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 and work around the, the, the synagogue, you still got to have something to wear. Your children still fall in love and still want to get married. You got to have something to wear. When you go there, all the issues of life are still on the table, even if you don't have enough money to pay for what you need. And Dorcas supplied that. She had a heart, according to Scripture, that was filled with compassion. Because that's what Scripture said. It said she was full of good works and charitable deeds. Charitable deeds, which means she was giving away more than she was selling. 
even though she was probably a master seamstress, a master seamstress. She probably could have, could have lined up the runway in New York on Fashion Week because of her skills, but yet she was giving away more than she was able to sell. She not only made the clothes for them, Scripture says she befriended them. They became a part of her intimate circle. I can tell you right now, there are a whole lot of tailoring shops here in Birmingham, but I also know a whole lot of folk who go to somebody's back door and knock on it because that person in there knows how to, how to sew and put together uh, 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 outfits like nobody else does. They might not have a formal shop with a business license, but they're turning out more business for folk than you ever heard of. Not only that, at a pinch, after hours, when you can't get to one of those shops with those office hours, you can still call Miss Dorcas in your neighborhood, and she can still hem a prom dress, hem line, and she can still do all those things that need to be done they are Dorcas is still in our community right now. And in that community, those people, those widows, had no means of securing their own situation. And so they had to turn to Dorcas. And she showed them grace and compassion. It was a delicate situation for them now, all right? Not just then, but now. There are a whole lot of people who are marginalized in our community. They, they know how to go. They can. They can go and they can fill out the application. They can get the job. When the man tells them, just show up Monday with a pair of black pants and a white shirt on, that's a problem. Because they don't have a, a white shirt. They don't have the black pants that they need. Somebody has got to be willing to support them in getting to that first day. And they'll tell you, if I can just get to my job, then I can pay you back. But I got to get there and I can't show up on the first day without a white shirt and a pair of pants. And see, when you've been, when you've been, I'm gonna use this, when you have not been living in lack, you overlook these things. You take them for granted that people always have what they need, and can I come tell you today, people don't always have what they need. There are some people who know how to squeeze a penny till it hollers. They know how to make Groupons and coupons and, and BOGOs, buy one, get one free, work for their family. They know how to do all of those things, and there are others who share out of whatever they have. They don't have abundantly, but they know how to share. That's Dorcas. Dorcas connected with the vulnerable, the at-risk people in her community. And why are you saying this on Sunday morning at church? Because that's what church is. Church is not taking care of everybody that has. It's making sure that those who have not have access to it. Can I tell you that that's our mission? That's our core mission. Tell them about the love of Jesus Christ. Share the blessings that he has given us with those who do not have. We got to make sure that we're supporting people. People are hurting right now in this time of this pandemic. Those who had little have less. Those who did not have anything at all are struggling so bad because the traditional places that they could go to are not even open to them anymore. They are afraid of transmission, even in the shelters. And so for a few days, some of those shelters have even had to close their doors to make sure people didn't come in. Where is the church? In all of these times when people are struggling, when everybody's sheltering in place, where do you shelter when you have no place? When in this time of making sure you have all the resources you need, what happens when you start with no staples to work with at all? That's the job of the church, and that's the life that Dorcas is telling us. She put herself at risk. She used her own resources in order to help those in the community. She did what she could for them, and guess what that was? She sold. She sold. So simple, so effective. Nobody's asking you to go above and beyond your means and what you're able to do. Just do what you are able to do to help someone is the lesson that we get from Dorcas. She used her skills and her ability to help others. And if you're a fledgling seamstress, but that's what you want to do to help, you sew for about 100 folk. You'll get better at sewing. The more you practice what God has given you, the better you'll get at doing whatever it is you can for somebody else. She stands here as an unsung hero for all those folks. She stands in the place of all those folks who have done the best that they can and nobody noticed. Nobody paid attention to what they were doing. 
How many churches, church pews, have been lined with folk who have just done the best they could do for the folk in the church year after year? And it's not until, as in this story, we reach a place where they're gone that and people even pay attention to them. They are keystone members of church congregation, and it's not until they're gone that anyone even pays attention to the fact that that hole is not there anymore, and that's what happened in this situation. Can I go a little bit further? If Peter had not been close to her town, we still wouldn't be hearing about her. Just the fact that Peter, the, the, the number one disciple of Jesus Christ at this point, came through is how she's highlighted in the first place. How, can I, how do I know that? Because this is what happened. We don't even know why they sent for Peter. We don't know what they expected from Peter. After Dorcas dies, why is it that they send for the disciple to come in? Somebody had to have some extraordinary faith to even send. He was about 11 miles away. They sent two messengers there to tell him that this very important member of the congregation has died. What makes Peter get up and turn and come to see about this woman? I would suggest to you that it's the Holy Ghost. I would suggest to you that it's God trying to make people understand how important it is to not be important. Come on now, somebody ought to hear me when I say that. Everybody always wants to be out front and do big works. Everybody always want to come to the big funerals when everybody is, is celebrating the life of somebody everybody knew. But what about somebody who isn't known by everybody? What about somebody who just spends their life helping the poor and the downtrodden? That sounds like Jesus to me. What about those folk? Is that why Peter turned on his route to come and see this woman, this woman who was known by everybody and yet remained unknown to most people. And so he came, the Bible said. He came to see her. And when he got there, what a tribute he found. The scripture is very clear what he found. He said, and Peter got up and went with them. And when he came, they brought him into the upper chamber. Now, can I tell you something? I told you to underline up a chamber. And the reason I wanted you to do that is to know the time we were living in, in order for you to have an upstairs and a downstairs in your house, that meant you had some money. All right, so here we are, another level of understanding who Dorcas was. Dorcas had means and still didn't flash what she had. She had the ability to floss with people who had money, and she celebrated people who did not have money. Come on now, she worked both ends of the economic stratosphere. She helped those who had and those who had not, because Peter was able to go stay and go up to her upstairs bedroom where they had her laid out. And when he gets there, he finds a memorial like no other. The pathway is lined with members of the community who are showing him the garments that she has produced for them. You ought to pay attention to that. If you look closely at the original writing, you'll see that some of those folk were showing her robes that she had made. Others, it says, were showing her garments. Look at this. And showing the coats in verse 39, and garments which Dorcas made. Can I tell you, some of them were showing clothes that they had on. That might not mean anything to you. Hello. That might not mean anything right now if you can jump up and go in a room and open a door and you got 15 dresses in there. Yeah, it seems to me that if you got 15 dresses and Dorcas made them, you would take them off the hanger and hold them in your hand. But what I'm telling you is these folk didn't have but the one dress that Dorcas made for them, and they were showing them to Peter. What I got on, she made for me. When this goes, when this goes bad, what am I going to wear then? Because Dorcas isn't here anymore. So not only did he see what they were saying, he also understood what a keystone member of this congregation this woman was. He understood that these folk need this woman to be among them. And that's why I think Peter went in that room. 
And that's why I think he fell on his face. And that's why I think he beseeched the Lord and said, Lord, bless them. She's needed in this place. They need her. They need her example. They need her hands. And so he fell on his face. And he said the same thing to the Lord that he saw Jesus Christ say to the Lord when he raised Jairus' daughter. He used exactly the same words when he said, uh, Tabitha, get up. Get up. And the same power that flowed through Jesus Christ to allow that resurrection to occur with Jairus' daughter. The same power flowed through Peter into Dorcas. And she too had life placed back in her. She was one in that community who bore the sorrows of life for other people. She was a key connector to how those folk understood compassion to be. And the Lord said that day, I don't know why he doesn't say it other days for other people. I'm not here to challenge the Lord on when he does what he does. But that day, he said, Dorcas, you still have work to do in this community. Dorcas, you're still needed. And if for no other reason than to show that the power of resurrection has extended beyond Jesus Christ, he used her as an example. That resurrection is still available through faith in Jesus Christ. And guess what, y'all? She got up. The Bible said Peter took her by the hand and, and she got up. She was dead. She was dead before he turned to come see her. She was already prepared for burial when he got there. But the Lord saw fit that she should be raised again from the dead. And so she became the most famous person in town again, not because of the work she did, but because of the work that God did in her. She became famous. Now she's the resurrected seamstress. Can you imagine how her business went through the roof after she got up off that deathbed and came back? She didn't need no advertisement in the local paper. All they had to say was, Dorcas lived right over there, and anybody wanted their, 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 their skirt hemmed or their pants trimmed, they wanted to get close to Dorcas, and I guarantee you, because she was how she was, they couldn't get out of there without hearing about Jesus Christ. You might not have wanted to hear it when you came up in there, but you were going to get some work and a word from Dorcas when you came in there. Can I ask you this? Do you know any Tabithas? Do you? Do you know any Tabithas? Do you know anybody like that? Anybody in your community who has been blessing other folk? who gives of themselves freely. You can't hardly make them take a dime for what they do for you. Do you know anybody like that? Are you somebody like that? Most of the time when you find somebody like that, they are working in obscurity. Everybody knows what they do. Some people take advantage of them because they can't appreciate grace and compassion. There are other folks who simply know that if you need a good job, go to Miss such and such. Everybody's not a seamstress. Some folk do it with pound cakes. Some folk do it with sweet potato pies. There's some, there's some families that don't know that their grandmama couldn't cook. And their grandmama used to go down the street to Miss such and such. And Miss such and such was the one baking sweet potato pies for every family function they had all their lives. That was a Dorcas in your community. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not talking about my grandmama as if she was one, but I do know I found out when I was grown there wasn't hardly a function at First Baptist East Ball that didn't have five or six Lila May sweet potato pies on the table. I found that out later, and then I found out that folk used to come to the house pulling sweet potato pies out the front door because mama was always making sweet potato pies for somebody. That's a darker spirit. And there are people all over town. There's some folk who retire, but don't sit at home all day. They go around and pick up other folk who don't have cars. And they take them to doctor's appointments. And they take them to the pharmacy. And they take them to the grocery store. And they take them shopping because they don't have anybody else. That's a Dorcas spirit. Nobody ever pays attention to them. But they're helping. They got their own jitney service, but they don't charge no money. These are the folk who would show up and say, Lord knows I'm going to miss her if the Lord called her home. Last thing I want to tell you is this. Don't ever underestimate the power of grace. 
Dorcas had always, always done her best to help folk. But when she got to a place where she couldn't be helped herself, those same folk who she had helped turned around and talked to the God she talked to them about, called on the name of the Lord that she had served. And that same God who had blessed Dorcas all those many years, that same God came to her rescue, came to her side, and his grace became abundantly clear. If you ever want to know whether there was a thriving church in Joppa, I can tell you right now, people who were on the edge of deciding jumped all the way across the line when Dorcas got off that bed. Because the God she talked about came to her rescue. While she, you know, if you're sowing, that's a patient job. You got a lot of time to talk while you're sowing. You got a lot of time to testify and tell people how good God is. You got a lot of time to meditate on the scripture. I can't imagine how many times she held court, how many times she preached while she was sowing. I can't imagine if you're a cook and you're good cook and know what you're doing and ain't got to read like other folks, all the recipe, you can talk and mix and stir at the same time. You can talk to somebody about Jesus while you're doing the work you need to do. I wonder if y'all know any Dorcases out there. Jesus is still blessing them every day. She's an unsung hero. She doesn't wear a cape, but she sure made them. And the Lord blessed her not to have to have her own PR firm because she could let her works speak for themselves. That's what I came to tell you today, that when you do the work of God, you can let your works speak for you. And they will. They'll come out and they'll be a testimony to how good you've been. I know, I know, everybody in this day and time always wants to puff themselves up and tell everybody what they've been doing. It's simply the nature of things. But can I tell you this? Jesus never had a PR firm, yet everybody talks about it. Jesus never wrote anything about himself, yet there are more books written about Jesus than any person who's ever lived Jesus Christ never had anybody to go out and tell who he was or what his mission was other than himself and maybe his cousin John the Baptist. And yet there are millions of people who testify to the goodness and greatness of Jesus Christ. Just go out and do you. And if you do you and what God has graced you to do, God will fill in the blanks and do the rest. Jesus Christ came. He lived for us. He died for us, and can I tell you, he was resurrected for us with one purpose in mind, that you and I would have a right to the same eternal life with his father that he has. Do you know him? In the free pardon of your sins, do you know him? Will you see him for eternity in heaven? Do you know him? Have you given your life to him? Now's the time if you've never made that decision. If you know today that you've been a sinner, if you realize that you've been on the wrong track, you want to get your life together, now's the time for you to bow your head, confess the fact that you are a sinner, accept the fact that Jesus Christ died for you, and receive the fact that he now lives for you. If you can simply do that, the Bible says, you shall live and live again. God bless you today. I'm so thankful that you came to celebrate with us here in this place. I know of some Dorcases out there this morning that got up on the job. Keep doing what you're doing. Your work is not unnoticed. God sees what you're doing. Until we get together again, I'm going to keep praying for you. We'll see you next week at the church that's striving to be the friendliest church from the parking lot to the pulpit. God bless you. Through Christ we love The police